federal judge is siding with Harvard in a landmark admissions case, ruling the university did not discriminate against Asian American applicants. But an appeal is already in the works. At issue is a lawsuit filed by a group called Students for Fair Admissions, which accused the administrators of setting quotas for the number of Asian American students admitted each year. Harvard officials deny using quotas, saying race is only one factor in the admissions process. And in a 130-page ruling yesterday, Judge Allison Burroughs agreed, writing that while Harvard's admissions program is, quote, not perfect, the court will not dismantle a very fine admissions program that passes constitutional muster solely because it could do better. She also added the program is necessary and narrowly tailored to achieve diversity. While this particular case is being brought on behalf of Asian American applicants, many argue it's a referendum on affirmative action as a whole and expect it could end up in the Supreme Court. So what does the ruling mean? Join me to discuss our Gregory Davis, a doctoral student in African American Studies at Harvard. Good to see you again, Gregory. Thank you, sir. And Natasha Wariku, a professor of education at Harvard and author of The Diversity Bargain and Other Dilemmas of Race, Admissions, and Meritocracy. At elite universities and such. It's great to meet you. Thanks, Thanks for being here. So, there's a piece in the Globe a few minutes ago, Shirley Leung, a business columnist, mm -hmm. headline Harvard ruling is a defiant defense of affirmative action in higher education. Is it? Yes, but it's not just a defense of affirmative action, it's a defense of the effort and strategy and and precedence it takes to establish an admissions program that Harvard has. Um, Harvard's program is not just kind of, you know, putting applications on a scale and seeing how many extracurriculars or how many activities. It's a very intricate, multi-layered uh, system that requires the inputs and ideas of many, many different people. There are lots of checks and balances, and the court recognized that in, in saying that Harvard's admissions program um, worked and passed its constitutional muster. Is he right? Well, it, yeah, I would agree with that. Um, I think, you know, I think the thing to keep in mind in this case is that there are two issues that were sort of conflated in this case, right? So one was this question of, is there discrimination towards Asian Americans in admissions? And the second was this question of affirmative action. And I think the plaintiff very cleverly tried to sort of merge those two things together to say, there is discrimination, therefore we should end affirmative action. Now, those are two different issues, right? But I think in the end, the judge said, there is no systematic discrimination towards Asian Americans, no intentional discrimination, um, although there are some questions about, you know, the sort of personality rating that might play a minor mm -hmm. role. Um, but in fact, um, overall, the system is um, in, um, in, it, it is in compliance with the law uh, related to affirmative action. Can I challenge this whole affirmative action thing for a second? Again, last time you were here discussing this case, Jeannie Soup Gerson from the law school, Harvard Law School was here. She had written a piece in The New Yorker basically saying, and I'm putting words in her mouth, so my apologies if she's watching, this case was about aff affirmative action, but it's not anymore. Because originally when this case was brought, they were arguing, the plaintiffs were arguing, that affirmative action couldn't be taken into account at all. And the judge in this case, in denying a, some preliminary motion, said that issue is settled already. Yeah. Supreme Court has determined uh, affirmative action may be a factor, not predominant factor, a factor. So that's not even before the court. So at least my sense from then is this was really just about whether Asian American applicants were uh, discriminated against at Harvard no more. Was I viewing it too narrowly? Well, I think, you know, that if you if you think about who is putting forth this case, Edward Blum. Edward mm -hmm. Blum is the person who was behind the previous affirmative action case that went all the way to the Supreme Court. Out of Court. Texas, right? Out of yeah. Texas. Fisher, is that Abigail Fisher versus yeah. Texas. And she's a white, she's a white young woman who uh, sued the University of Texas. So his clear motivation, he was behind the gutting of the Voting Rights mm -hmm. Act. His clear motivation is to end race-based considerations in all aspects. And I think he really turned to Asian Americans because he, you know, they're kind of strange bedfellows. He mm -hmm. found some Asian Americans who um, were wondering and had questions, and I think reasonable questions, about are there any kind of quotas? Is there discrimination? Why is it that Asian Americans have tend to uh, seem to ha need higher test scores, um, et cetera, in order to get into Harvard? And that was the question. But to me, those are two separate questions. In the end, the judge, I think, also recognized these two issues in her ruling, and she spoke very systematically to both of them. So what are the implications beyond this individual case, in your estimation, of this Burroughs ruling, of the judge's ruling? Well, 
One of the important things is that on at least five occasions since 2000, since the turn of the century, the Supreme Court has made some decision regarding affirmative action. Who can regulate it? When can it happen? When can it not happen? Who can we give deference to, et cetera? Um, but the important thing to remember is that in the Greta and Gratz cases in, the, uh, in 2001, uh, the Supreme Court, uh, Justice Sandra Day O'Connor in particular, has set a pseudo expiration date on affirmative action. 25 years or so? 25 years or so. And we're rapidly getting to that deadline. Well, so, didn't Burroughs say, Am I right? Didn't she say in her decision that, that maybe a little optimistic? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, I, I and I would and I would also say that. But I think the, the neither nine, of you are Supreme Court justices. Yes, I should say just to the be nine clear. people who go to work in robes. Uh, those are the people who are going to see this clock is running out. And this case is is uh, is on its path to to reach the Supreme Court at around that deadline. So it's not just about whether or not. Um, Harvard was discriminating against African Americans, I mean, Asian Americans, but also and principally about whether or not taking race into consideration as one of many factors is still constitutional and still necessary. I want to return to the Supreme Court possibilities, but since you slipped and mentioned African Americans, mm -hmm. I want to mention something you wrote, I think it was about a year ago, talking about how Asian Americans uh, who get in compared to their percentage of the population, it's significantly higher. Mm -hmm. African Americans who get in, it's significantly lower. So I didn't know if you were saying that because the number is higher, by by definition, Asian Americans can't be discriminated against, or if you were saying uh, African Americans are far worse discriminated. Against. Where were you yeah. going with that thing? Um, I don't. I wouldn't say either of those. I oh, think that okay. you could have. You could have. Um, I mean, I think this is the case where Asian Americans, um, in terms of academics and their extracurricular measures, according to the lawsuit, um, are rated higher than um, uh, their white peers, their Latino peers, and their mm -hmm. black peers. Um, and so they are overrepresented on campus. Um, and there could still be discrimination. Um, I think I was. Um, you know, I, I, I will say that, in, having looked at the data, I think that there. There are some questions, but I think if there is any kind of implicit bias going on, I don't think there's any systematic discrimination. I don't think there's any um, quota system that it's very small. And but I so I think that you can have both of those things. Um, and I think that you know when we look at the outcome of underrepresentation of particular groups, I think that should be sort of a, a, a canary in the mind that there's something wrong here. If we think that you know um, uh, African American young people, Latino young people are just as you know, uh, meritorious have just as much strive, are just as smart. Then there's something wrong with our system. Is there something in this decision that an admissions office, other than Harvard's, uh, could look at and say, "I care about diversity as a critical goal." There's something in that c that can allow me to do what I want to do better. Or is this so particular to the facts of the this case? that its applicability is, doesn't expand beyond. So ever since the Bakke decision in the 1970s, Harvard's admission system has been set as kind of the vanguard mm -hmm. um, for constitutional as well as kind of practical ways of which to do admissions the right way. And I don't think anything about that has changed. Burroughs' decision goes through a lengthy finding of fact about the, the intricacies of that, of that of the admissions process as well as the ability for an individual reader even very far in the process to say, hey, wait a minute, there's this one applicant who we glossed yeah. over two steps ago, I want to bring that person back up. Those kinds of checks and balances, those types of um, you know ways around the kind of systematic process of the system helps alleviate this idea that any one group is being heavily favored or heavily discriminated. Okay, we only have 30 seconds left. He commented on uh, his what he believes may happen on the Supreme Court roughly 25 years after this statement was made. Is this a case that the Supreme Court would take? And if they do, Sandra Day O'Connor isn't walking through those doors anymore. What happens? Yeah. Well, I should say I'm optimistic that the court is not going to take the case. I mean, this has been settled law for, you know, decades. And I think that there's that it nothing... That may be a factor. That there... Um, sorry, that the... I think it's settled law that right, yes, race, race, is, be race factor, can yeah. be a factor, yeah. and that they've done it in a way that is in in line with the, the mm -hmm. um, legal uh, what's permissible. Um, so I'm optimistic that there's you know that they will not take the case. I will say that if they do take it, I think it's worrisome, um, and you know the court obviously has changed since then, and we don't know what will what what they'll rule. Uh, Natasha, I'm really glad to meet you. One, nice two, to meet four, you. Long time. Thanks so much, Gregor. Great to see you. Great again. to get back. Appreciate. Here.